let us begin. So good afternoon and welcome. I'm Pat Perizzini, Director of Alumni Engagement, Regional Chapter Development for Fairfield University. And I am so thrilled to be able to bring this presentation to you via Zoom. In my position here at the university, I have the pleasure of working with alumni from across the country, coordinating with chapter leaders and volunteers to host events that keep alumni connected to and engage with Fairfield. We have nine regional chapters from Boston and Washington, D.C. alphabetically, and from Boston to San Francisco geographically. So I hope to meet you all in person at an event in your local area in the very near future. Excuse me for a second. Thank you. I know you've all been on a lot of Zoom presentations and right now somebody is uh, mowing the lawn next to me. <laughs> so, Before I introduce our esteemed guest presenter, I would like to go over the format of the lecture today. There's a PowerPoint slide presentation and our guest lecturer will be speaking to those slides. We will break for questions, so please type your questions via the chat function on the Zoom and I will re relay them to our guest. And please make sure your video and audio capabilities are turned off. Back by popular demand, I have the great honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. Kurt Schlichting. Dr. Schlichting, Fairfield University, is the E. Gerald Corgan 63 Chair in Humanities and Social Sciences Emeritus. At Fairfield, Dr. Schlichting served as the Dean and Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and is a member of Phi Beta Kappa. Waterfront Manhattan, From Henry Hudson to the High Line, 2018, is his third book for Johns Hopkins University Press. Grand Central Terminal, 2002, won the Association of American Publishers Award for Best Professional Scholarly Book in Architecture and Urbanism. Grand Central was the basis for the 2008 PBS American Experience, Grand Central, an award-winning documentary. Dr. Schlichting was the academic advisor and appeared on screen as well. His academic research is at the cutting edge of the field of historic geographical information system HGIS, which he used to study the Irish in New York and Newport, Rhode Island. In the spring of 2017, he was a visiting fellow at the Moore Research Institute, National University of Ireland, Galway. Currently, he is the co-director of the NYHGIS, New York Historic GIS, centered at the New York Public Library and is an advisor to the Library Center for Digital Humanities. He remains active at Fairfield University, serving as co-principal investigator for the Center for Social Action's major project to conduct a needs assessment for the United Way of Greenwich, Connecticut. Kurt and I have now partnered four times on events, two actual tours of Grand Central Station and one of the New York City Warfront, and then our inaugural online offering, and these events are always incredibly well attended. I give you all Dr. Kurt Schlitz. Well, listen, I want to say hi to everyone who's here, who's here remotely. I guess we're all getting used to this, uh, this world of Zoom. And um, it may be a new reality for lots of us for the, for, for the foreseeable future. Well, that was very nice of Pat to give me that, uh, that uh, biography. And, and as Pat mentioned, I, I, my most recent book is Waterfront Manhattan. And that was published in 2018. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, talk to you about Fairfield University as a Gilded Age tale. And it's about the founding of the university. And I want to set that into a particular framework. So here are the major questions. You know, how did the Industrial Revolution change American society? I mean, we take it for granted. And now we're, some argue, in the post-industrial a revolution. We're in the computer revolution. And then why do we, we, it's a particular era. It's at the, from the end of the Civil War in 1865 to the Great Depression. And that's called the Gilded Age. Well, it turns out that Mark Twain and Dudley Warner, a partner of his, published a book, The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today, in 1873. It's not what most people think of when they pick up a, a, a Twain book, and it's certainly not his most famous books, but he, he really did set the tone or the theme of a Gilded Age. And is 
Fairfield University part of that particular tale. And we'll, we'll, we'll make our way through that. This is also a story of New York. And in the, in the Mat Waterfront Manhattan book I published, I looked at the history of New York City and the use of the harbor. And it's really one of the greatest natural harbors in the world. If you've had a chance to visit New York recently, there's been a rebirth of the waterfront. You can go to the Brooklyn Bridge. You can go to the various parks and sit and look. And at one time, this was among the most important harbors in the world. And it made New York City. New York City's origins are with the trade of the United States with other countries through and eventually through the Panama Canal um, and, and also the obviously the, the other canals that were, were built all through New York State, the Erie Canal being the most important one. And it's a, it's a, it's a harbor that's well suited for the, for the role it took on. And one important part of New York Harbor is that at low tide, there is deep water right up to the, to the waterfront, especially on the East River. And that's an enormous advantage for a particular port. I do like that particular chart I have up where I'm from a, a, a British naval chart that's at the New York Public Library. And New York prospers. New York prospers throughout the, the uh, 19th century. And by the 1880s, it's the largest city in the United States. There's over a million people on Manhattan Island. You got to remember, and I put a reminder there, that the city of New York is simply Manhattan Island until 1899 when the other outer boroughs are added. And this is um, this particular map that you see is called a bird's eye view. So that there were cartographers in the 18th century, 19th century, who thought of presenting a city through the eyes of a bird. And by 1880, this was by far the busiest port in the United States. It was the second busiest port in the world uh, next to London. It also was the center of the United States financial system, the, the system that finances our industrial revolution. And it's a leading manufacturing center. We're familiar with Wall Street, but New York had thousands and thousands of factories producing all sorts of goods that were shipped all over the world. And it was the primary port where during the century of immigration, from 1824 to 1924, that's the, cent the century of immigration. Millions of people came to the United States from all over the world, especially from Europe at, that, at this particular time. And New York was the primary port they entered. And they entered eventually through Castle Garden, which is in a Battery Park that you can see there on that particular map. And uh, for example, the United States Archives has a database which I've been working with. It's called the Irish Famine Database. And um, it's between 1846 and 1851. And there are 604,000 records of ships coming to the United States, coming to the Port of New York, and the Irish are flooding into New York City. And um, by certainly the 1880s, there were, there, was, there were more Irish Americans living in Manhattan Island than there were in Dublin. So that it's, it's important to think about this ascendancy of New York. And it will play an important, it plays a center role in the Gilded Age. Now, the, the most important product of the American economy for the entire 19th century was cotton. And that cotton was a result of slavery. And we can, we can never forget how important cotton was to the American economy and the British economy. 
Ironically, what happens in England is the English Industrial Revolution is a revolution in the production of cloth, in particular cotton. So throughout the 19th, 19th century, cotton was shipped between the United States and Liverpool. And then that, and then Liverpool sends back gold and silver, and that funds the American Industrial Revolution. And by the way, this is the cotton triangle. I remember this in high school. You would have a textbook on American history and they'd have a picture of the cotton triangle, the triangle between New York, Liverpool, and the American South. And ironically, much of the cotton was first shipped to New York, not directly from Charleston or Savannah or New Orleans to Liverpool, but rather first up the coast to New York on smaller sailing ships. It was unloaded and then loaded it onto much larger sailing ships that went directly between New York and Liverpool. And New York City, the financial industry, the shipping industry, the insurance industry funded the cotton, funded the slave plantations in the American South. And you can see on that chart on the left uh, that cotton was the single most important export for the American economy for a century. Well, then what begins later in the United States than in England? Now, sometimes we think the Industrial Revolution is the American Industrial Revolution, but the British Industrial Revolution began at the, the end of the 18th century, so that we have to remember that. But during this period called the Age of Energy, from 1865 to 1915, that period of 50 years, the United States industrializes. It's textiles, it's steel, it's oil, it's railroads, it's electricity. And here are some of the central figures in that industrial revolution, and I'm sure many of you can name who these particular photos are of. And um, so I'll put their names up. Thomas Edison and Electricity, Andrew Carnegie, Steel, John D. Rockefeller, uh, Oil, J.P. Morgan financing all of that, and then Cornelius Vanderbilt is going to build the New York Central Railroad. So these are some of the titans of the American Industrial Revolution, and they're characters larger than life, and they're incredibly wealthy. They're incredibly wealthy. It's the equivalent of the wealth that was generated by the computer revolution in in. Silicon Valley. The, the wealth is on the same scale. And of course, part of this is this railroad age. So look at these two maps of the United States, 1860 and 1890. That's just 30 years. And you can see on the left, there were railroads. They were primarily in the, in the American North and a little bit out to to the Midwest, but not in the American South. And then 30 years later, you have a railroad system that covers the entire United States. We've already built the Transcontinental Railroad. We've tied all the states together. And think about this transition. We had a colonial world, the world of the American Revolution. In 1790, these 13 colonies, the 13 states, were overwhelmingly rural and agricultural. There was practically no industry at all. And then you move to an industrial world, which is urban. It's filled with immigrants. They're laboring in the factories, in the coal mines, and the finance, and this produces enormous wealth, wealth on an unimaginable scale. And that wealth is going to fuel 
the Gilded Age. We, uh, we're, we're, we live in, now in Newport, Rhode Island and go up Bellevue Avenue and you see mansion after mansion that was built on the wealth of the American Industrial Revolution. Well, Cornelius Vanderbilt is certainly a character in this story. Uh, there's a book by, uh, by Tyler Anbinder called The First Tycoon. And he starts out in an, ag in an agricultural America. He's born in Staten Island on a, on a farm. He's a, his, his ancestors came from the Netherlands. It was a poor farm. And he borrows some money and he starts a, a, a ferry between Staten Island and Manhattan. And that's a, the, that particular type of ship you can see, it was called a Perry Auger. And he makes a fortune. He, he's, he starts in steamships. And then when he's quite old, he starts in the railroads. And he builds up a railroad empire in a very short period of time. He's now the richest man in the United States. And there's a, a caricature on the, on the left. He has 11 children. And he has two boys, nine girls, two boys, William Henry and Cornelius. But he's America's first tycoon. And he'll play a role. He play, his, his family will play a major role in the Gilded Age. Well, they build a dynasty, a railroad dynasty, from New York to the Midwest, and it's the New York Central Railroad. It's the second largest railroad in the United States, which makes it the second largest railroad in the world. It's the third largest company in the United States. The Pennsylvania Railroad is larger, and eventually uh, J.P. Morgan uh, organizes U.S. Steel, and U.S. Steel is the largest company in the United States. But there's a dynasty here. When the Commodore dies, his one son, William Henry, inherits the greatest fortune in the United States to date in 1885. It's the greatest fortune. It's the third generations, it's the third generation that really are in the center of the Gilded Age. And you can see William Henry's family. There's Cornelius II, William K. And those two are, are certainly well known. Less well known are Frederick Vanderbilt and George. And then there are two sisters, Florence and Lila. And in Newport, Cornelius, William K. and Frederick build these, build mansions, and we'll look at some of them as we move forward. George Vanderbilt goes down to Asheville, North Carolina, out in, the, out in the Great Smoky Mountains, and he builds the largest home ever constructed in the United States, and he calls it Biltmore. And it's now, uh, it's still privately owned, but you can go to Biltmore, and it's part of the Great Smoky National Park, which Vanderbilt bought and then donated, eventually the family donated it to the National Park Service. Um, Florence has a home in Newport, and Lila uh, marries William Webb, and if any of you know upstate Vermont, uh, just south of uh, Burlington is Shelbourne, and you can go to the mansion and grounds that they built on, um, on Lake Champlain. And of course, at the center of this and at the center of New York is Grand Central, which I wrote about. And uh, the Commodore built a depot in 1871 on 42nd Street, which you can see on the left. And then eventually that was replaced in 1913 by the Grand Central Terminal that we see today. And I'd like you to just uh, take a note there that the architect is a man by the name of Whitney Warren. And we'll come back to Whitney Warren. Well, another family stands certainly as, as grandiose as the Vanderbilts were, so were the Rockefellers. And we're familiar with John D. Rockefeller. Um, he goes to Cleveland at the beginning of the 
the petroleum revolution in the United States. You can see on the left-hand side, the first oil well is drilled in 1859. Then the, ref the, the oil is not, is not processed where it's drilled. It's shipped to Cleveland. And by 1889, uh, Standard Oil has a giant oil refinery in Cleveland. And remember that the first product is not gasoline. It's not heating oil. It's kerosene. It's a distillant of the oil that was pumped out of the ground in Pennsylvania. And I'm sure if you were to talk to many of your grandparents or they might remember the kerosene lantern or having kerosene heat their home, but not gasoline. And Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller is one of many, re, many refining, refining companies, the Standard Oil Company, but John D. Rockefeller pursued the other companies and he bought them out. He would have partners in his business, they would bring capital and they'd buy some of their competition. And then Standard Oil would prosper and they'd buy more of their competition. And eventually you can see there in the bottom, in the middle, that they, they moved to New York and set up a finery, a refinery on Newton Creek. Newton Creek separates Queens and Brooklyn. And uh, that was a prosperous refinery for Standard Oil because they could ship their kerosene and later gasoline directly from New York Harbor to the rest of the world. And on the right, you can see a kerosene delivery wagon. These were ubiquitous all through America. If you live in a, even a small town, uh, Standard Oil would ship in their products by, by rail. They'd load it on these, car these little wagons and they'd distribute it to people for their homes or businesses. Well, the Rockefeller dynasty is, if anything, it's bigger than the Vanderbilt dynasty. And the argument is that John D. Rockefeller had been, <laughs> was the richest man in American history. He had more wealth from Standard Oil than Bill Gates and Steve Jobs had from the companies that they started. And in 1937, uh, the estimate is that that's worth $340 billion. Now, he has a partner, William Rockefeller, his brother. So I'd like you to keep his name in mind. And then Rockefeller, John D. has just one son, John D. Rockefeller Jr. But then there's a, a third generation, and you can see them. Uh, Abby, John D., Nelson Rockefeller was governor of New York, Winthrop was governor of, Ar of Arkansas, Lawrence Rocker Rockefeller was a philanthropist, David Rockefeller was president of Chemical Bank in New York, and there's a connection here. There's a Fairfield University connection, and it's the Jennings family. And I want to show you, well, what happens is, as Rockefeller and his partners buy up more and more of their, the competition, they set up a trust and they hold the shares in Standard Oil and many of the companies that they bought, they hold them in the stand, what's called the Standard Oil Trust. In 1870 is when Rockefeller decides to incorporate. It was a partnership. He had a part of his, William was a partner, Harkness was a partner, but they needed to have a corporation. And so they decided to incorporate. So they must have sat around a table in their offices in Cleveland, and they decided that they would incorporate with 10,000 shares. That would be the, the wealth of the, the shares of the, the original shares of Standard Oil Trust. And the incorporation included 10,000 shares. And you can see that John D. had the largest share, Harkness and a partner of his, an early partner, and his brother, William, 
at about 1,300 shares each. And then the last 1,000 shares went to Oliver Burr Jennings of the Jennings family of Fairfield. And sometimes in, in when I would say he had one-tenth of the, the, the shares, uh, you know, a student would raise their hand and say, well, you know, geez, well, what's a thousand shares? Well, let me tell you something. If any of you can imagine owning the first one-tenth of Microsoft, the original shares when Bill Gates and, and his partner sat around the table and incorporated and if you had one-tenth of that, the original shares, which have gone up in value and then split and gone up in value and split and gone up in value and split, you would be truly wealthy today. And you'd be very generous to Fairfield. <laughs> well, the Standard Oil Trust is not without controversy. It was, it was a monopolistic enterprise that, that Rockefeller built. His argument would be that he brought kerosene and later on oil and gasoline to the American public at the lowest possible cost, but that there was the controversy that the trust eliminated any real competition. By the 1870s, Standard Oil controlled 90% of the drilling, refining, and sales of oil in the country. And between 1882 and 1901, there's going to be large lawsuits filed against the Standard Oil Trust. They gave out dividends of $551 million to the original share, mostly to the original shareholders. But some stock splits had, had occurred by that time, and that's basically $15 billion. So think of that as the wealth generated by Standard Oil, which is going to go to the shareholders the original shareholders and others that followed, but it isn't a large group of people. By the way, in 1911, the antitrust suits against Standard Oil reached the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules that it is a monopoly. It violates the, the, the anti-monopoly uh, laws of our country, and they, it's ordered to split up. Well, the Rockefellers come to New York. Down at 26 Broadway is the Standard Oil headquarters, which, by the way, uh, years ago, uh, the offices of Quick and Riley, the Quick family's company, were in the old, what had been the Standard Oil headquarters. And then, of course, later on, the John D. Rockefeller Jr. builds Rockefeller Center. So the Rockefellers are drawn to New York. All of that, the, the, the wealthiest Americans uh, of, of, this, this, of, our rev of our industrial revolution are drawn to New York, are drawn to New York. Well, the Gilded Age. Um, the Gilded Age changes America. And it, it's all, it, one thing it does is it drives an arch architectural style. And here's my question. Why does the Gilded Age turn to Greece and Rome and the French and English aristocratic worlds for its architectural inspiration? And this is particularly obvious in New York, uh, Newport, and eventually in Fairfield. So we want to think about that, the Gilded Age. Well, if we contrast that with the colonial world that I mentioned to you at the beginning, um, in Fairfield, you can go to the David Ogden House, which was built in 1750. If you live up and along the coast in Connecticut, you could visit East Lyme, where there's some very, very old colonial homes. And of course, here in Newport, there's a rich trove of colonial homes that st survived. Well, these are modest places to live, aren't they? This, by the way, these would have been the homes of wealthy, wealthy people in the 18th century. To be able to afford clapboard was expensive. And 
you had a particular, certainly through New England, you had a particular way of organizing the, the local architecture around a green in the center of town where the wealthiest people in town would, would build homes that were elegant, but not ostentatious. And an example would be the Congregational Church, the first church up on Greenfield Hill. That has a particular style that's, that's modest. And the Quaker Meeting House here in Newport, Rhode Island, the Quakers had no decorations. If you go into this particular building where they often have lectures and you go down, you have uh, wooden church pews and you have beams. There's no interior decoration. The Quakers were modest people. Even the Quakers who had earned a great deal of money or a relative had wealth, they were modest. So that was the particular style that we begin the American experience with, and then we get this. And here are the homes of Cornelius Vanderbilt II, the eldest son of William, of William Henry Vanderbilt. He builds this monstrous home on Fifth Avenue and 57th Street. It fills the entire block, which became the Bonwit Teller Bonwit Teller occupied the, the skyscraper, the lower parts of the skyscraper that replaced that. And then here in Newport, they built the breakers. And the breakers still exist. And of course, it's a big tourist attraction. You can walk through the breakers. And notice that the architect of these two buildings was a man by the name of Richard Morris Hunt. But my question to you all is where does this style come from? This is not, a, a, you know, some, somehow a giant log cabin, or it's not an enlarged colonial home. There's a complete break with the past. There's a complete break with colonial America. And you have this particular style, and this is an aristocratic style that is imported from Europe. And how? Well, Richard Morris Hunt, is the first American to go to a French school of architecture called the Echo de Beaux-Arts. And Whitney Warren did as well as you can see on the right-hand side. And this was a school that the French government had established to train architects for the French monarchy and for the French aristocrats. And they were very good at it. They borrowed from Greece and Rome and they translated it into the breakers. And it was a very different school that they went to. They didn't really go to lectures or not, but it's, it's a fascinating story. And Richard Morris Hunt goes there. He's the first American to attend. And um, he becomes, he starts the American Association of Architecture. And then later on, Whitney Warren, the architect of Grand Central, studies at the Echo de Beaux-Arts. And here's a picture of uh, the building where the Echo was on the left bank. It was established in 1671, repressed during the French Revolution, but then restored in the reign of Louis XVIII. It's, it, it returns, and it's a particular style. And it comes to America, and it certainly comes to New York. And here's two perfect examples. One is Grand Central and Terminal City that followed the Grand Central and went up, and the intention was to go up Park Avenue to the north of Grand Central, which it did. And you can see the Biltmore Hotel. What was the Biltmore Hotel next door to Grand Central on the left-hand side? And that's where they're building the big tower today that's um, the monstrous modern building next to Grand Central. And then on the left, you have the New York Public Library on 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue, the New York Public Library's research library. And both of those buildings were built simultaneously in New York during the Gilded Age. And they both draw on historic precedents from Greece and Rome. 
when I bring my students to the, to the New York Public Library, we stand in between, in the middle, right between the two lines, and the building is exactly the same distance to the left and right. It's completely symmetrical. That's the, that's the, that's the Beaux Arts. That was Greece and Rome. And this was a style that certainly attracted many New Yorkers. And then later on, William <laughs> Richard Morris Hunt goes to Newport and for William K. Vanderbilt builds the Marble House. And the Marble House is an exa almost an exact duplicate of the Petit Trayon at Versailles. So if you were to be visiting Paris and you take the, the, the train out to Versailles and you go to the, the, the palace, you can find the Grand Trion and that's a replicate. And then he builds this, this dining room with, gil, with gold gild. <laughs> it's, that's what it is. And this is, again, this is, this is, this is, a, this is an extravagant view of architecture for the Gilded Age. It has no co connection at all with the American architectural past, which by the way, um, the Guild, many of the Gilded Age architects could also do the shingle style buildings that you can see in Newport. And they do harken back to our colonial past, but not, not, the, not for the Gilded Age and not for this particular family. And of course, there's another part to this, and it's the upstairs and downstairs and backstairs. Many of the immigrant women who came to America during the Gilded Age, from Ireland and Sweden and France, they worked in the mansions because the mansions mimicked the aristocratic world of France and particularly England. And I'm sure many, many of you watched Upstairs, Downstairs. And it really is the upstairs, downstairs, and the backstairs. So if you look at the 1910 census for Marble House, you can see that the chambermaids, the laundress, the kitchen girl, they were Irish. And the footman and the butler, the butler was from England, ran, the butler really ran Marble House. And then in the back stairs were the, the scullery maid and the, the laundress and the people who supported the entire, um, the, the, the entire edifice. And this was true of all of the mansions in Newport. There's a large Irish American community in Newport today. And their descendants of, many of them are descendants of the people who came to work as servants here. In. And of course, that's the Fairfield story, isn't it? The first students who come to Fairfield come from immigrant backgrounds, including my own. <laughs> and the Gilded Age was a social. There was a. There was a. a, a, a the, the Gilded Age was a social life that you saw portrayed in Downton Abbey. Well, in in March of um, William K. Vanderbilt. Uh, on March, in March of 1883, had a ball and was called the Ball of the Decade. And that was a way of, by the way, for the Vanderbilts to break into the society that existed, which was of primarily Dutch and English descent. And they weren't part of it. Certainly, William, uh, certainly Commodore Vanderbilt was not part of it. But uh, William K. wanted to be, and certainly his wife Alva wanted to be. And look, they're going to this fancy dress ball and they're dressing up like English arist aristocrats. Um, William Cage is, is Louis XVI. What happened to Louis XVI? Ask yourself that. He got his head cut off. And Marie Antoinette, was, they were beheaded in the Place de Concorde in, in, in the middle of Paris. And then later on, they're, they're mimicked at a fancy dress ball. In, um, in the at the home that William K had on Fifth Avenue at 52nd Street, just down the street from his brother uh, Cornelius II. And Whitney Warren attended. Whitney Warren was the architect of Grand Central. He was also um, 
in that social milieu, in that Gilded Age. And then uh, we want to take this one step further. The, not only did the Gilded Age mimic or, or model itself in New York particularly and in Newport and other social uh, venues on the uh, aristocrats and of France and England, but what they also did, what these very, very wealthy industrialists did is they married their daughters off to the, and sometimes penniless, English and French aristocrats. And the, the example of that is Consuela Vanderbilt. That's William K. and his wife Alva's daughter. And Alva arranges her, arranges her marriage to the Duke of Marlborough in 1895. Now the Duke of Marlborough, the family name is Churchill, was established by the British government in 1702 to reward John Churchill for his uh, gallantry as a, uh, as a general in the English armies fighting the, the, uh, fighting the French. And they, the, the, the uh, English crown built Blenheim Palace for the Duke of Marlborough. Uh, Blenheim Palace is outside of Oxford. And notice the name Churchill. Well, Winston Churchill was born at Blenheim Palace. His mother was also a American heiress. Her name was Jenny Jerome, and she married a Churchill. The problem was she didn't marry the Duke of Marlborough. She married the then Duke of Marlborough's brother, who wasn't the Duke. And therefore, Winston Churchill, for all his life, was a commoner and not a uh, British aristocrat. Uh, William K. provided uh, Consuela with a dowry of $2.5 million. You know, there's, there's stories written that um, that provided the toilets in, in Blenheim Palace or the electricity. You can pick whatever. That's the story that's often told. Uh, she was divorced in 1921. And by the way, she returned to America she moved in in the summertime. She went back to the Marble House with her mother, Alva, and they were suffragettes. So they, she spends a large part of her time, effort, and money into trying to secure the vote for women. So she was a, a leading suffragette. Well, I think it's um, time for some questions here. And then we're going to take the story to Fairfield. Thank you, Kurt. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Schlichting? And there'll be time at the end as well. All right, Kurt, I think we can uh, continue on. OK. All right. Well, I'm just going to go back to, I, li I like the pictures of Blenheim Palace. By the way, I've. I visited Oxford a couple of times and once did a tour of the, uh, of, of the grounds. I didn't go into the, the palace itself. It's still owned by the Churchill family, by the way. And if you want a fancy wedding, you can, um, you can, you can rent Blenheim Palace. Well, I want to now return to or turn to the Jennings family. Um, in Fairfield, there's Jennings Road, there's Jennings Beach. So we're familiar with that particular name. And the Jennings family goes back um, to the, almost the founding of Fairfield. For example, the 1790 census, of, uh, the first census we ever did, uh, there are 25 families with Jennings as their last name in Fairfield. And... Um, we saw that this name before Oliver Burr Jennings. He was born in Fairfield. He moves to New York. He's ambitious. He wants to uh, leave Fairfield, a small town in, in still rural Connecticut. So he moves to New York and enters what was called the dry goods business, providing, uh, selling um, 
selling clothing and, 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 and accessories. And then in the gold rush, he moves to San Francisco. He moves to San Francisco in 1949. But he's not, he doesn't go to the gold fields. He's not going to get a pick and shovel and go out to try to find gold. What he does is he and a partner set up a business to, to ship goods, dry goods, supplies that the, the miners needed, the gold, the gold miners, to San Francisco, and then they sold them. And he made a, a very handsome uh, a small fortune doing that. He comes back to New York and then he moves to Cleveland and he meets Esther Goodsell. And she, her, she's the sister of the wife of William Rockefeller. And Jennings goes into business with the Rockefeller brothers. And you can see where this particular story is, is going. And uh, he has five children, Annie B, Walter, Helen, Emma, and Oliver G. And he dies in 1893 in New York. Now, you can see on the right, by this time, the Jennings family, because the, some of the stock had, of Oliver Burr had been passed to others in the family, and more stock had been created. In 1892, they owned 3.4% of the Standard Oil Trust. Now, in that long drawn out lawsuit that eventually ends up in the Supreme Court, documents, financial documents, um, especially in the Ohio suit, became public information. And between 1882 and 1901, the trust distributed $551 million. And that's in $1900. That's almost $600 million was distributed to the, the trust. And you can go look at the documents and see how much of that went to John D. Rockefeller. And the largest portion did. But the Jennings family, during this time period, their share of the trust paid $16.6 .6 million in dividends. And that's an extraordinary amount of money at this particular historical time. It's worth about $500 million in today's money. So the Jennings family was very, very wealthy. They were extremely wealthy. They were among the most wealthy, wealthiest families in the United States. And then Oliver G. Well, Oliver G. is the youngest son, and he, by the way, when when William, when Oliver Burr dies, and they his his estate goes through probate, he gives gifts to a whole bunch of people, and then says the remaining part in my trust will be divided equally among my five children. So Oliver Gould Jennings inherited one-fifth of uh, basically the, the, the wealth, the fortune of his father. And he lives, he lives a Gilded Age life. There's no question about it. He goes to Andover Academy. He then attends Yale University. He gets a law degree at Columbia. He enters a law firm in New York. He's a, a prosperous, what we would call today a corporate lawyer. Has two sons, and he dies in 1937 in Fairfield. And I'm going to get to where he dies. And there's a picture of William K. of, of Oliver G. relaxing on the yacht of William K. Vanderbilt, a motor yacht, not, not William K.'s uh, uh, racing sailboat. 136 foot racing sailboat. And he had, Oliver G, had a home on 2 East 75th Street, right off of, par, uh, right off of, uh, of uh, Fifth Avenue. And his next door neighbor was Benjamin Guggenheim of the Guggenheim Museum family. So he was incredibly wealthy. And he had a summer home in Newport and a winter home on Jekyll Island in Georgia. 
and he moved in this Gilded Age world. Uh, he had a, a home in, uh, the family had a home in Newport. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side here, that's a, 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 that's a, a Google map. I, I turned on the, um, the landscape. And you can see if those of you who have been to Newport, you come down Bellevue Avenue, you end at Rough Point, you take a right hand turn, you go down a little extension, and you make a right left and you're at Bailey's Beach. It's actually Spouting Rock Beach Association, but everybody calls it Bailey's Beach. It's the fanciest, it certainly was the fanciest beach club in the country for decade after decade after decade. There's a famous picture of Jackie Kennedy holding John, um, John Kennedy, um, her, her son, in her arms, and it's at Bailey's Beach. And then you can see Rough Point, and if you look to the right, Frederick Vanderbilt built Rough Point, which he sold to the father of Doris Duke, and it's eventually now with the uh, with the Restoration Foundation here in Newport. And you can see where the Jennings Cottage was. The cottage, the, these were <laughs> giant wood frame buildings. And it was up the street from Edith Wharton's home at Land's End. Now, remember, they're not, I want to, want to just mention that they're not contemporaries of one another. Edith Wharton, by the time the Vanderbilts move into this, per, I'm sorry, the Jennings move to this particular cottage, she's already left uh, for France. But Edith Wharton is the Age of Innocence, and the Age of Innocence is a perfect movie to watch to understand the Gilded Age. So the, Van, the Jennings in Newport, they were part of, they were members of, of Bailey's Beach. They were in the social mayor of the, of the Vanderbilts in Newport. Well, what every uh, wealthy Gilded Age family needed was a country estate. So you would have your home in New York, your summer home in Newport, You'd go to the winter Jekyll Island. Well, you needed a country estate. Well, the, Vander, uh, the Jennings family had, had long ties to Fairfield. So over time, what Oliver Gould Vanderbilt does is he buys enough property to create a 255-acre country estate. You can see it outlined there in red. Oh, this, by the way, this is, a, this is a 1934 aerial map of Fairfield, and I've superimposed on it the boundaries of the Jennings estate. And of course, we call Fairfield Beach, we call it Jennings Beach. Now, are, you might remember Oliver G. had a sister, Annie B., Annie B. Jennings, and she inherited as much of money as Oliver G. did. She never married. But her home, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, was here. This is the old post road here, and her home was here, Sunny Lee, and she owned all the land down to the water, including Jennings Beach, which she donated to the town. And the Fairfield Beach Club that you see at the end of Beach Road was her cabana. Cabana. She was a philanthropist in Fairfield. She donated the first part of the Fairfield Public Library, the building where Tomlinson Middle School is. That was Fairfield High School. She donated that. Uh, she was active, an active philanthropist in, um, in New York City. Uh, by the way, she was not a suffragette. She wouldn't support uh, women's voting, but that's a, a, a a larger story. So Jennings has this large country estate. Well, you need a building on this country estate, don't you? Now we're looking at that we've zoomed in on this aerial photograph and see the circle in the middle. I'm going to show you that in a moment. That's the manor house. And you can see where the prep is below the manor house. And then across, across, um, North Benson Road, there was the farm, and it was literally called the Jennings Farm. 
And you can see where Radford Field, Field is now was um, land that they grazed uh, their sheep and cattle on. It was a farm. That's what an aristocrat did. That's what they did in England. That's what they did in France. That's what they did in the United States. They, they took the model of the English country estate, Blenheim Palace. There were sheep and cows at Blenheim Palace, not near the, the mansion, by the way. And that's what they did. And they spent, they spent the fall at this estate every single year. So the, they, they'd live in, the man, they'd live in on East 71st Street in the wintertime. But after they came back from Jekyll Island in the spring, then they'd go up to Newport for the summer season. And then they'd come to the Jennings estate uh, late in the, for the early fall. Well, the, he builds a home called Malins. That's the country home he builds. And some of you must be able to, to, to see that particular building. And you can see on the bottom left, he has extensive greenhouses and gardens. And that includes going down to uh, the Rafferty Field. They were extensive greenhouses. So this is Malins. And the servants followed them around. You can see the 1920 census for East 71st Street. There were 12 servants. Six from Sweden, three from Ireland, one from England, one from Finland, and one from Connecticut. But 11 of the 12 were, were immigrants coming to America for a variety of reasons. And then they, they work as domestic servants at, in East 71st Street. And then later in the next census, by this time, uh, Oliver G is, quite, is getting much older and he's 64. And they've, they're basically living now in Malins. They're not living full-time on East 71st Street. And they have 10 servants in the 1930 census. And by the way, for, for, for Malins, that doesn't count the people who worked on the property itself. There were probably 30, 20, or 30 other people who worked keeping the grounds um, mowed and all of that type of work. And I just picked a, a name there, Bridget Egan. She, she had come from Ireland. She was 22. She was single. She had been in the country just for three years. And she, she was a servant at, the, uh, at, the, at Malins in the 1930 census. Well, there's a second industrialist that I want to add to this story, Walter Lasher. He was a Bridgeport industrialist, and you can see he was 1870. His, he was very wealthy. The estimate is he had an $80 million fortune at one time in his life. Um, he wasn't part of the New York uh, Gilded Age. He was part of a much smaller built Gilded Age in Bridgeport, where he was very wealthy. His company was American Chain and Cable. He was it was a very successful company. He was one of the highest paid executives in the country. And um, one of the products that they, that they had the patent for for a period of time were tire chains. You know, when the first Model T was built, the wheels, the, 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 the tires were all bald. So as soon as it snowed, you needed some way to grip the, grip the, uh, the pavement. And so you could buy chains for your, your car. You still see these in, up in Vermont in the wintertime. Now, William Lasher decides to build a mansion in Fairfield, and he finds 100 acres of land on Round Hill Road, and he builds Hearthstone Hall. Well, Hearthstone Hall, we know what Hearthstone is, is going to become, and he spent a fortune doing this. Here's an invoice that's in our Fairfield archives. This is from a, the Hayden Company. They were known for decorations of, of mansions. And uh, this invoice is from October in 21. And it's just for the interior furnishings of Hearthstone Hall. And the bill is 200, almost $300,000. And you can see there, one sofa, $2,800. This could be 
I don't know, for many of us, this would be, uh, the, the furniture would be that pretty expensive for, for our homes, wouldn't it? And, but this is the way, this is what Lasher wanted to do. He wanted a country home as well to mimic probably the Jennings family. And I don't know, the records are not clear whether or not they socialized together. That's not clear at all. So think of, um, think of uh, Lasher as the, the local industrialist. Well, then we bring this forward to the Jesuits and the founding of Fairfield. You can see that the Jesuits have been here since uh, revolutionary time. Georgetown was founded in 1789. By the way, these are not all the Jesuit universities. St. Louis is 1818. Uh, University of San Francisco comes before Boston College. In 1926, the Jesuits are prospering. Many, many, many men are entering the order all through the country. And so they, they form the New England province for just the New England states. And around this time, uh, the province had, uh, the Jesuits had 3,000 priests in the New England province alone. And of course, this leads to the founding of Fairfield in 1942. So what the New England province had been doing was they were in touch with uh, Bishop McAuliffe of Hartford. Now, both Connecticut and Rhode Island, there was only one bishop, and that was the Bishop of Hartford. And they said to McAuliffe, what we'd like to do is to open a high school in Southern Connecticut. We know there's many Catholics. There's no Catholic uh, high school in that area. And we see that as a, as a need. Uh, the Jesuits had a, a, what was called a retreat house on an island, uh, jutting out into Long Island Sound uh, in Norwalk. And so they were familiar with the area. Well, September 15th, 1941, a formal letter comes from Bishop McAuliffe to Father Dolan, the provincial. And it's a very short letter. And he says, yes, I'd like you to open a high school, but in the Bridgeport region. And then there's a second paragraph and the second line says, this invitation includes the founding of a college in the same area. So now the New England province wants to start a high school and then eventually a college in Fairfield County. And so a mad scramble begins to find a property. You've got to find a piece of property that's big enough to have both a, a high school, which, which eventually becomes Fairfield Prep. It's called Fairfield Preparatory School. That's what all the... Um, the New England Province High Schools, uh, Boston College Prep was, is Boston College Preparatory School. So they got to find a property and they want to do this quickly. Well, it's the end of the Gilded Age. The Great Depression ends the Gilded Age and then there's death and taxes. And this Gilded Age ends just at the moment that the Jesuits are searching for a property. Well, in the Depression, Lasher goes bankrupt in the, in the 1930s. He's overextended. He's had a fortune that was estimated to be $80 million. Most of that is gone. He can't keep up Hearthstone Hall. So the town of Fairfield foreclosures on the Lasher property for back taxes. And it's abandoned. Well, then Oliver G. Jennings dies in 1937, and the Jennings, his estate goes through probate, and it's affected by the Depression and taxes. There are taxes that had to be paid, the Connecticut succession tax, the Connecticut estate tax, and of course, there was a federal estate tax. What in current, <clears throat> the current um, political battles and we've had is was called the death tax by um, by in Congress often. Well, the the Jennings descendants are want to want to keep their mother. She's not dead. 
They've got this big house in Fairfield. They've got a house in Newport. Uh, they still have uh, the property in, in 75th Street, which they've leased. But they're, 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 not, they're not bankrupt, but there are a lot of financial pressures on the Jennings family. And uh, from their probate records, we have um, a student, uh, Riley Barrett, went down and found the, the uh, probate court records for the Jennings family down at the, uh, the probate court down on the green in Fairfield. And um, they're, they're giant pieces of, um, of, they're way bigger than a legal document, the probate court records. And uh, Oliver G. owned 21 parcels of land in Fairfield, which a value of $400,000. The homestead was 77 acres. It was called Parcel 1, and it included Malins, and the value was $130,000. He had $900,000 in the bank, and his stock was worth $6 million. So the total estate's value was $6.9 million. That's in 1937. The Great Depression is still with us. We're not going to recover economically till World War II gets underway. And this is truly a fortune. It's still a fortune. And you can see on the right, there's a long full page list of stocks that he owned. And I highlighted the Standard Oil stock. And that was the single largest stock, uh, valued stock he owns. He still owns 46,000 shares. Now remember, these shares have, have uh, split and split and split and split. And that was worth uh, almost $3 million. So there's a huge estate here. And that includes Malin's, Malin's, well, he has to pay the, listen, this, this went on for, it took six years to settle this estate. And finally, the estate paid the state of Connecticut um, to the two taxes owed. And then they pay the Internal Revenue Service $1,828,000. That was huge. And that, these three taxes, accounted for 33% of the estate. So to pay these taxes, they had to liquidate the stock that you see above, or they had to go to their bank accounts and take money out of the bank to pay their taxes. And you have this giant home mailings and all that property around it. Well, Father Dolan continues to negotiate. He negotiates with the Jennings family. There's, there's concern that uh, one of the sons doesn't want to sell to uh, a Catholic re religious order, uh, but they don't have any other offers for the property. And they decide to sell Malins and 77 acres, uh, surrounding 77 acres that make up now Fairfield University. And they sold that in December of 1941 for $43,879. That's McAuliffe Hall. And notice below, there's a headline that we found in the archives. The Bridgeport Sunday Post, which came out Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, said, the headline said, Beautiful Jennings Estate Sold to the Jesuits. Well, you all know that Pearl Harbor hadn't happened yet because it was, it was five hours before, it's five hours time difference, and the attack hadn't happened yet. And then later on in April of 1942, um, Father Dolan, the provincial, negotiates with the town of Fairfield and, 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 and Catholics in, in Fairfield, Bridgeport, who are helping the Jesuits put this deal together for the Lasher property. And on April 2nd, 1942, um, Father Dolan uh, signs the papers and sends a check for $62,500 to the town of Fairfield for the, uh, for 
what would become Bellarmine Hall. So <laughs> this is like a, a small miracle. The Jesuits find two adjoining estates in Fairfield, which put together are uh, just over 200 acres of land. And we'll buy more. We'll buy a property on the corner of, uh, of uh, North Benson Road. And, uh, and, and that's for $106,000. Now, that's, that's worth quite a bit of money today, isn't it? That's about $2 million. But gosh, you look in the Fairfield uh, Citizen or you go on to uh, Ravis Real Estate, how many, how many homes are for sale in Fairfield today for $2 million? I bet you there's a lot on the market. So this is a, this is a foundation story. This is a foundation story. And of course, this is our, our Gilded Age tale. There's the Jennings estate. And you can see in the blue is the Fairfield University. That, that jut out to the north, we, we bought from, from, a, from an, an order that had bought it from a person who bought it from, from Jennings. And that's where Do the Dolan campus is. And there's McAuliffe Hall. You can see it next to North Benson Road. And the Jennings farm to the, to the east has been developed. And um, I should have put this particular street Parkwood Road, and that's where I lived for most of the time I was at Fairfield, or we were living in Fairfield. And Bellarmine Hall is over here. This is the Lasher. This is the Lasher property here. And then this particular property is the Morehouse property, which we also buy. So this is our campus here. And it's our Gilded Edge tail. So I'll, I think I'll stop there. Do we have any questions for Dr. Schlichting? Kurt, you know, I always um, love to listen to your presentations, but this one, um, as a resident of Fairfield for 34 years, I was so interested in hearing about the, this part of our history um, and Fairfield views as well. Um, Mina Perry just um, actually sent another landmark in Connecticut um, and related to the Gilded Age and also New York City. So Harkness, uh, one of the partners at Standard Oil, um, he has the Harkness House Mansion on 1 East 75th Street in the beautiful Eolia in Waterford, Connecticut in Harkness State Park. And so, there's, there's yeah. right, he, he, has, he has that. And of course, Harkness goes up to Yale and he builds the main part, the, ma the major downtown section of the Yale campus, the, the colleges in that, you know, there are a knockoff of, 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 um, of Oxford and Cambridge. And then of course the major research library is the Harkness Library. Yeah. He was a philanthropist as well. Okay. And, um, but can you imagine, uh, you know, those of you who are, can you, you couldn't have put this property together. The Jesuits couldn't have done that. You couldn't have gone to, 50, 60 landowners in Fairfield. For example, they looked at, maybe some of you know, must know where Fairfield Country Day is. That property was the Fairfield Country Club and they thought of buying that, but it was too far for the students from Bridgeport who are gonna come to Fairfield by, by bus. It's too far to walk. Uh, if any of you know where uh, the, uh, the chimneys mansion is in Bl the Black Rock section of Bridgeport, up on top of that hill in Black Rock, they looked at that particular property. Uh, they thought of going to downtown Bridgeport where there were some large uh, uh, estate-like buildings down where the University of Bridgeport is now. But here's this property and it falls together. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, Paul Lakeland and I, uh, Professor Lakeland and I, are working on a, a Fairfield history project, and we, we're looking for a title. We might call it The, the Miracle on the Sound. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a few more questions, Kurt. Okay. So, uh, John Hurley wants to know, when were the two prep buildings built? The, the, two, the two new prep buildings are... Um, they're, they're after World War II... We, well, the prep can't build in, during the war, because, World War II, because all the construction materials were, were, were rationed. 
So I think the first pregnant, Xavier goes up in 50, uh, 51. I'm going to miss my, my date here. I think they're 46, 47 when they start those prep buildings. Okay, okay. From Sarah Rosh, what happened to the Jennings home in Newport? Is it still there? It's still there. Okay. It's still there. It went, it, it, they sold that. It went to a couple of families. And then for a period of time, this is what's happening in Newport, it was divided up into condominiums. And then a, uh, a wealthy industry, a wealthy hedge fund person mm -hmm. has bought it, bought out, bought the condos and is returning it to a single family home. Oh. By the way, just, just as an example of that, uh, there's a famous mansion on the, on the, on the ocean in Newport. Uh, we all called it the Hurricane House because it, a hurricane had washed through that. And it had been abandoned. And then it was turned into condominiums. Jay Leno bought it and bought out the five people who owned condominiums in it. Oh, wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, gosh. That's incredible. Yeah. From Mary Frick, the name Gould was mentioned. There is yes. a park in Fairfield, uh, Gould Manor. Right. Um, do you know if there was a house there? There wasn't a house there, to my knowledge. Uh, Gould was um, his... I'm trying to think there's a relationship inside the Jennings family with the Goulds mm -hmm. and that um, that's a public park. It's, it's cool. It's Gould Manor, but that right. was part of the Jennings estate. Okay. That was part of the Jennings estate. So when you cross, if you're at the home Depot, you go underneath the throughway, um, you're going up. Um, I forgot the road there and you see Gould, park, Gould Manor park to the right. That had been part of the Jennings estate. Right. I think that's on Crestwood, or it becomes Crestwood. At Crestwood, some point. yeah, going yeah. up Crestwood. Right. That's that's all the Jennings that had been all the Jennings estate okay. the estate there. You know, they not that they had the they had the mansion on the hill. Mm -hmm. They had the gardens, but what you also had was a was a small forest, <laughs> and that particular part of Fairfield was was forested, and they they. They had a carriage track that went into the forest. And there's a river there. There's a little stream yeah, yeah. that's dammed up. You know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. Pat. I Pat, do. Down, down the corner there at, at uh, Parkwood. That, that was, Jennings did that so they'd have a place to swim. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I have a uh, question here from Jim Reese. Could you comment on the wealth disparity in the Gilded Age versus America today? And since oh, Fairfield gosh. was um, an indirect, direct beneficiary of death taxes, do you think the death tax needs to be reconstituted from where it stands today? Well, we're we're in a we're in a period of of of, um, of vast wealth created, yeah. and that has really we're as unwealthy uh, we're we're as as there's a, a largest gap between the super wealthy people, the one percent, and the rest of American society now as it was in the it was in the Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. Some people are arguing that it's greater, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we, we see it here. You, you see it in Fairfield. Think of Fairfield Beach. Uh, I don't know the ages of everyone who was, who was on here, but when I went to Fairfield in 66, um, you went down to Fairfield Beach. Those were shacks. You know, people had them for the summer. You know, there wasn't, there might not have even been insulation, maybe no wallboard on the inside. But, you know, Fairfield students thought it was great. And, of course, right. there was all men then. You know, we piled in there. And, <laughs> and, and I don't want to say we studied a lot. But look, go down Fairfield Beach now and go along Fairfield Beach Road. It's, it's like a, a wonderland. It's just these giant mansions that have been built. And that money comes from, from Wall Street. It comes from the, uh, you know. And, and, by the way, it comes from many Fairfield, you know, many, many Fairfield graduates have succeeded in that world and we're, we're the beneficiary of that. Right. Right. Kurt from Janet, Fairfield was founded in 1942, but when did actual classroom teaching start? 1947. So that the, the idea was to, you know, the war comes and the drafts on. Um, 
and men are being drafted. We're going to have 12 million people in the armed forces. Excellent. I think it's 16 million in four years are going to per, predominantly men are going to go through the American military. So there, there wasn't the, the, the population to, to start a college immediately. So we start in 47 and the first class arrives in 47 and then they're going to graduate in 51. So I think our 75th anniversary is kind of a moving target, isn't it? Mm. It could be 42. Well, maybe it's 41. We're chartered in 42. Okay. But the first class doesn't arrive to 47. Okay. From Julie Gottlieb, is the Gould in Oliver Gould Jennings the same as Fairfield's Gould, Gould Manor? Yes, it's the same family that so that when Oliver, when the when the when the Jennings family when Oliver's family when they donate that land to the town of Fairfield, they name it after and I can't remember just the whose 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 maiden name it is. Okay. But it's inside the Jennings family. Okay. Because Sarah asked that the name Gould linked to Jay Gould. Is they linked to Jay Gould as well? I, I don't think so. I don't know. Okay. No, I don't know the answer to that question. That's okay. that's a better answer. Okay. Um, another question from John. It looks like McAuliffe is much smaller than Maylands. What became of the rest of Maylands? Was any well, of the I, stone? Oh, go ahead. I, I don't, yeah, you know, you know, John, <laughs> my wife said that to me. What, what <laughs> happened to the rest of, um, if you, what, what's, what it's covered now, you know, the, the, the land going up there now is, is just all trees and we can't see the building to the extent of those pictures. That's a good question. I'm pretty sure it's still, it, it, it's, I, I think the main area of the, of, of here, let, if, let, let's, let's just try this here. If we go back, I want to go back to here. If you look here at this particular view, that's McAuliffe Hall. Right. But now, you know, the townhouses are here, so it's hard to see. But I, I believe that that that's that it's and the you know the Jesuits were, you know they they were delighted to find these buildings that they could they could move into so the prep opens in, in forty two and right. in, in the fall of forty two and they've got you know they've done some renovation in McCall Hall but not a lot mm -hmm. and then the Jesuits live in Bellarmine Hall and they needed to do less renovation in Bellarmine Hall. So right. they had a place for the Jesuits to live, and you had McAuliffe to serve as um, to, to to serve as a, you know the high school. Okay. Uh, the second part of John's question was was any of the stone used to build Xavier or other buildings? Do you know? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, okay. I think it was used decoratively around okay. the, the property, but I don't think to build the buildings. Um, you know the, the the prep buildings. There's there we have in our in our um, archives at the, at the university in the library. There's there's records of the building companies that built those buildings, and you know they had to wait till the the war was over to start them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that answers all our questions via the chat. Okay. Kurt. Well. That yeah, was great. You know um, how much I enjoy working with you. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, show, oh, I'll, sh I'll show my face, Pat. <laughs> I'll turn a light on here. There you I'll go. take off these things. I'll take off my glasses. Hi, everybody. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your uh, expertise, your talents, your time with us for the second time on a, uh, a Zoom presentation. So I thank you. Um, to the folks who were uh, attending yeah, this journey. Yeah, it was fun. It was yeah, fun. this was fun. This was yep. a lot of fun. Fun. Uh, yeah. Um, just to let you know, I've recorded this presentation and it'll be available on the university's YouTube channel. So I will send you all the links to that. And just as I always do, there's a reminder to visit www.fairfield.edu front slash alumni events to learn what's going on on campus as well. Um, Kurt, thank you. Yeah, I see. I see Dave Feeney sent a nice note. Say, hey, Dave. Yep. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to, good see to hear from you. Um, I can't I see him, but yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank be safe, all. everybody. Yeah, be safe. Thank you all for coming. Um, hopefully, I'll see you all in person soon. But until then, be well and stay safe. Thank you. Okay.
Take care. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.